This is a Phanatron tube in operation. The shift in brightness is due to a shift in the audio frequency applied to the radio wave. This is a blepharisma organism undergoing disintegration at an applied MOR or mortal oscillatory rate of 3,050 cycles. At a later date, it was found that a better MOR for blepharisma is 924 cycles. The difference is that in about 40 seconds at 924 cycles, many blepharisma will start to disintegrate. At 3,050 cycles, a process you're seeing here took approximately 20 minutes to get to this point. This is all live time, however. What is interesting is how the organism disintegrates and then forms these large globules, as you can see in the organism on the right. This is a very common occurrence. It occurs in many different types of organisms. This is a close-up of the same large globule that was on the right. You can see something's kind of happened to reorganize the, the material that came out of the blepharisma, and it's essentially just dis disintegrated down into these small particles. This is another blepharisma. Typical also of the blepharisma is that uh, the cell wall somehow becomes permeable to the surrounding fluid media and the organism will swell. Also, they will stop motion. Normally, these are very highly motile and swim quite rapidly across the screen. But as you can watch here, these kids get a little bigger. Finally, they blow out at the bottom. This seems to be pretty standard behavior for this type of uh, explosion or disintegration. my opinion that in some way the device causes some sort of osmotic gradient to occur across the cellular membrane, perhaps through a process of what's known as electroporation. More investigation needs to be done to verify this. you can see the interior of the organism has somehow undergone a reorganization and as it disintegrates it just falls into this small particulate matter. Again, all photography and videography in this particular videotape is live time. There is no stop motion here. This 
is another little protozoan. Normally this fellow, again, is very highly active, he's motile. But as it comes under the influence of the wave at its MOR, it starts to become immobile or semi-paralyzed, you might say. You can see, although it has flagella, they are not really beating synchronously enough for it to move. This is a few minutes later. As you can see, the interior of the organism somehow has changed its composition and refractility to the light. If you watch closely, you can see the flagella up around the mouth parts start to beat asynchronous, asynchronously and, in fact, actually stop beating. There you go, a few of the flagella up around the mouth parts at the top of the screen there are starting to actually fall off. This is a paramecium. And he's under the influence of his MOR. It's the body's slightly swollen. The MOR of this particular organism is 1,150 cycles. And typically, they are not motile when they're fully under the influence of the MOR. See, he's just starting to open a few areas within the cell wall here. These dark spots are starting to occur within the body. Apparently he's blown out on the back side of the organism. This is a rotifer. Now, this organism is kind of interesting because it has a very tough outer shell around it. What happens in this particular situation is that I believe that the device somehow liberates some of the enzymes within the organism's lysosomes, and it basically will self-digest. If you notice, the interior is pretty well differentiated here. In a few minutes, you'll notice that it just becomes rather just little more than a bag of mush on the inside. This occurred at an MOR of somewhere between 1950 and 2150 cycles. I really did not work out an exact MOR for this organism, but it lies somewhere within that range. What's nice about this particular shot, as you, you probably noticed that little organism that swam in and out of the video there, gives an idea that this is not being induced through some artificial media, such as a high current of ultrasound, or perhaps electricity, or some other media. This is actually done by the plasma tube being about four to five feet away from the microscope. You can see how the interior of the organism is starting to de-differentiate.
some of the mouth parts here or small flagella, I guess, along the exterior starting to fall off. At this point, it's pretty well self-digested its entire interior. Again, I believe this is due to lysosomal rupture. This entire process from the start of exposure to approximately this point was about 30 minutes. This is another paramecium. And I'd like you to look closely at the body. Notice it has these rather crystalline-like structures in it, and there's a little bit of density to the uh, structure of the organism uh, as it's under its MOR. Also, if you notice, it's not really highly motile at the moment. It's become somewhat confused. This is typical of paramecium when under the influence of their MOR. It takes a few minutes to get here. These organisms do have a very simple nervous system. Notice how the cell wall is becoming a little more sh sharply defined. This is the same fellow a minute or so later. And he's starting to rupture in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. As the paramecium disintegrates, its cell wall seems to fall into these little lipid crystalline-like structures. I would assume these are lipids.
after a couple of minutes, there just isn't too much left of the organism. Pretty well disintegrates into just particulate matter. Now this is a group of paramecium under the influence of their MOR. As you can see, if you've ever seen paramecium before under a microscope, these fellows are quite motile. But here, they're quite all stunned, and that's typical of paramecium at 1150 cycles when the devices operate. Now this is another paramecium that's just stunned, but look at the difference. He has not been under the influence of the MOR for very long, and the body does not have all this crystalline dedifferentiation, or shall we say, some kind of change that has occurred. Still quite translucent. This is another paramecium. All of the organisms, for the most part in this film, nearly all of the organisms within this film are all the protozoan family, which is significant insofar as protozoans are a major pathologic problem for mankind. Primary of, of these would be malaria. Malaria affects many millions of people every year and kills about 1% of the people that it infects, as well as causing a lifetime of disability and impairment for many people that lack the facilities to be properly treated for their infection. Notice how the density of the organism has changed with time while under the influence of its MOR. Here's another one that's just kind of undergoing an, an explosive evisceration. At a certain point in total time of exposure, all the organisms will explode, but some are a little more susceptible than others. In this picture, you can see a couple of blisters actually forming on the body of the organism. This is the same fellow we were watching a minute ago. He's starting to explode now. Just a large mass of food. See the blisters on the right-hand side of the body? And here's a situation where all of these exploded more or less around the same time. It has to do with total time of exposure. This is a white blood cell in live time. And this is some of the influences that the device produces on white blood cells. It increases their motility as well as their phagocytic ability. At the moment, although it may be a little hard to see, it's actually engulfing a particle here at the bottom of the screen. A little black round particle just swallowed. And it's going to go down a little bit and do this again. It's a 
another particle that's engulfing. On its leading edge to the right. Here it's picking up another particle. This is a blepharisma. You notice the little densities at the rear of its tail. Keep watching, you'll keep seeing the body swell.
watch the large blue globule that just formed at the bottom of the screen and watch some of those little particles just kind of keep increasing. And what's a, quite a bit of curiosity here is although these particles are now leaving through a rupture in the wall of that blue sack, keep watching the films. You'll see these keep materializing and actually increase in number. May also point something out. There seems to be kind of a current flow around the particular piece of structure here, but if you watch some of these little particles, some of these are moving against the current flow. Many of the particles, however, are just showing plain old brownie in motion. I don't know what's going on here. Some of these particles just exhibit brownie in motion. Some of them seem to be actively motile on their own. This may be what Dr. Bichamp originally called as a microzyma. I have no idea or Dr. Nassans might call a somatite or a somatite. This is another plethorisma. This particular video was made with my new condenser made in Russia, and it has much better quality and sharper resolution.
what's interesting about this particular video is that the cell wall here is going, undergoing complete disintegration. You can actually see it fall apart. See, there's one of those globules that just kind of self-formed itself, full of all this small particulate matter. Now, all this film was done under the 40x objective. We're going to take this up to the 100x objective here in just a second and give you a real close-up. Now we're under the 100S objective, and if you are looking at this particular video on a 27-inch monitor, the magnification factor here is approximately 11,000 times. This particular little globule here in the center of the screen, I would estimate to be about the size of a red blood cell or a little larger, maybe about eight microns across. What you're looking at now is a slightly blurred view because what I've just done is I flipped in the digital view zoom on the video camera 
which is a 4x zoom. So right now you're looking at something that's being magnified about 44,000 times if you're looking at it, the video on a 27-inch TV. Problems are at this type of magnification. One is you lose resolution. You can see it's pretty blurry. And the second thing that happens is that I'm not too sure. Sometimes you get a whole lot more information out of it. But sometimes you do. You can pull in quite close and see a little more that you could see otherwise. Now this is back at the standard setting. This is about 11,000 diameters, again, on a 27-inch TV. The immense magnification factors come from the fact you have a TV screen of a certain size and a size of what's called a charge couple device chip inside the video camera. And the smaller the chip, the, lar the smaller the cross section of the slide it looks at, and therefore the larger the magnification factor. This is another protozoan. This fellow has an MOR of somewhere between 930 and 1,000 cycles. He's going to undergo a cell wall rupture, which probably is due to some sort of osmotic problems within it. curious little organelle, have no idea what that is there towards the center of the screen. We have a nice little rupture of the cell wall, and it's kind of peeling outer membrane off the organism. It's just ruptured. We've got a little sur surface tension holding the interior protoplasm kind of against the body of the organism. This is another paramecium, and you can see very clearly there's a cell wall rupture here. Integrity of the wall has completely failed, yet the outer membrane is still intact. that membrane that is peeling off there is what's classified as a unit membrane, then its thickness is about 100 angstroms.
Here we have a nice picture of the blister phenomena. Again, this is a paramecium. They seem to do that quite readily. Now, this is the blood of a 25 to 26-year-old male. Came to me, wanted to see if a device he had built, to my specifications, was operational. This is prior to any exposure. The fellow had undergone surgery approximately 30 days earlier. Uh, he has facial and throat cancer. Actually had to lance this fellow three times to get any blood out of him. His blood was so clumped together like this. Needless to say, he complained about being cold a lot. These are some white blood cells here at the top of the picture. You can see the blood kind of sticks together in clumps, but it also kind of pours like like honey or molasses. I mean, these cells should are pretty well stuck together and agglutinated. Again, this is prior to any exposure to the device that he has, the plasma tube device. You know, the background's just pretty blank and nice and black. That's the way most people's blood looks. He has a few little fibrin clots here or there that it's not really seen real clearly on this video. You also notice most of the red blood cells are not very round looking, quite crenellated. Now this is after the first exposure, approximately 24 hours afterwards. See there's a little bit of particulate matter in the background. The blood cells have tend to unclump slightly. They're still all quite damaged looking, the blood cells, but you can see all the particulate matter that's been released by the use of the device. Also, some cellular debris here and there. a large clump of cells that were broken off by the device. a rather large cell, squamous, plate-like. This is a white blood cell. It has some curious anomalies. What I'm do doing right now is I'm using inverse video, which gives a 3D-like effect, and you can get a concept of what the surface of the cell looks like. You see from this video, it looks like this fellow has a hole punched in him there or something. Not a very healthy white blood cell. There's a little anomaly found floating in this fellow's blood. Again, this is after the first exposure. Believe this is an abnormally dividing bacteria. 
looks a little bit like a propeller. This is another abnormal finding in this fellow's blood. This is under 100x magnification with a digital zoom full out. So you're looking at about 44,000 diameters here. So you can see there's some advantage to being up with that kind of power. This is from a scraping from an external tumor that was growing out of the fellow's nose. There's a little anomaly found. Upper part of the screen there. There's a couple of what look like probably staphylococcus. This is a regular little zoo growing here. Some of these are infected cells, uh, parasitized, you might say. Now, this is after Fellow's second exposure to the device. You can see the amount of cellular debris has picked up considerably. There's larger cells, there's more cells. There's a, just a generally quite a bit more debris within the, the blood here. At this point, it was recommended that he not use the device for several days in order to let his blood clear itself of all this debris. That's something that does need to be developed is some kind of protocol as to how much debris a person can tolerate and that his body can safely remove. A load factor, so to speak. If the rate of removal of this cellular material and the death rate of the cells is higher than the rate at which the cells are being reproduced, then wherever this material is coming from should disappear. But if the growth rate of the tumor or what have you that this material is originating from is higher than its death rate and the ability of the body to remove the material, then something must be done to stabilize or slow the growth of the tumor. See, it's just loaded. This is after the second exposure. Quite a dramatic release of material here. Now, I didn't expose this fellow. That was all 
his machine, his exposure. We're now going to go on to assembly of the parts into a fully operational device here. It's quite simple. This is a Cobra model 19. And this is the bottom of the CB. All the bottoms of the CBs or tops have this grill-like opening for the speaker. And that's a side in, on all of the devices or CBs that you will remove to access the electronics. What we're doing now is removing the back surface of the speaker in order to remove the wires off the little microphone on the inside. Here you see the two wires that are connected to the microphone. This is standard in all of the microphones of all three CB units that, that we use. In some manner, there's a little microphone about this side in all of them. There are these two wires attached to it that must be removed with a soldering iron. You just heat the, the wire up and remove it. What I do is place a small scratch pad underneath with the cardboard side up. It's just a, something to keep heat from getting through and melting the plastic and a nice surface to work on. Apply a little solder and heat to an eyelet. And we solder up our wires we just removed from the little microphone. Now, this is where you're going to put the holes. You're going to drill into the microphone itself to mount the eyelets. Here we are doing a little drilling. And now we have our number six screws, either one half to three quarters of an inch long. We're going to insert through the holes we just drilled, like so, with our eyelets and secure down our eyelets. Very simple. Then all we have to do is add back in the little nuts to secure at the front. Notice there's a pivot point on the microphone key. All microphones have this. Make sure you reinstall the pivot point properly back in the case and then test it so that the key will close properly and spring back. And inserting the lid back on, one must make sure that it is properly secured all around the outside of the microphone so that the gap is even. And be sure and test the key to make it sure it doesn't bind. What we're doing here is testing to find out which one of the two connections is positive. Now, the negative side will cause a connection to be made to the ground. And so that would cause the, the multimeter to make that tone. So what we do is we mark the microphone as just shown with a little positive on the opposite side where it doesn't make the tone. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm showing that the 
output of the CB is about four to five watts here. And I have it set on the internal dummy load, and I'm showing how changing the antenna match and the transmatch buttons shifts what's called the SWR. And you want the SWR to be down at the bottom, just like that, with the needle on the right-hand side of the meter and the needle that reads on the left-hand side of the meter to be as high as possible. And there's like oh, the key and the power is off. Now we're removing the top cover, or bottom cover as the case may be. And this is RV2. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a little screwdriver and we're going to take and turn that RV2 in a counterclockwise manner as far as it'll go, just like that. And that completes modification of the CB unit. Now what you can see is that the unit produces about 10 watts of output. And we've done that by using induction setting L, and it's been over on the dummy load position. Now here we have a very small plasma tube that I am putting a modulated wave of about 700 cycles into the CB with. And we've lit this tube up showing you that you can actually light these small tubes, as in the lower power unit, with just a citizen's band radio that we just modified to overmodulate. There the tube's off. Now if you watch, we key up. The two needles cross at a high level, approximately an SWR of three, and then it's brought back down, in this case by turning the transmatch button, bring it into light, and then bringing the SWR down. Again, needle on the right as low as possible, needle on the left as high as possible. Now this is showing the difference in changing the applied audio frequency. Here we've got a 492 cycles. And I'm going to turn up the power and watch what happens to the needles on the SWR meter on the tuner. You can see it actually climbs up a little bit, starts modulating more power. I'm going to shift by a factor of 10 here by punching this other button, and we're going up to about 4,700 cycles. And what I'm doing is I'm kind of peaking the meter. You can see it's making almost 20 watts now up here at this 4,726 cycles. We're now going to modify the Maxon MCB30. And again, you can see the little waffle holes on the bottom for the microphone, and that's the side we're going to pull off of the unit to access its interior. We're going to take our screwdriver here, and we're going to turn RV2 right there. fully clockwise, just like that. This is a Maxon microphone, and we're going to modify it just like we did with a Cobra 19 and put those two little screws on it 
and mark the positive side in such a manner. Only the negative side makes the tone. The positive side you should mark. Now we're going to modify the unit in 510XL. And the first thing you have to do to the unit in's microphone is you have to remove this little label on the outside of it with a knife. Be careful, don't cut yourself. But it's made out of aluminum and, it'll, and that's where we're going to mount the screws. In this case, the screws are going to mount on the front of the microphone. there and there. Now inside the microphone there's this large metal plate. You must remove that by removing that center screw as such. And out it comes. And then we have our standard little microphone in the center. We have to remove these two wires from the little microphone speaker, as before, using a nice soldering gun, just as such. And to those, we'll attach our eyelets, as we have done previously. As you can see, there's a problem here. The unit end does not have a direct ground. So what you have to do is look on the inside of the microphone, and there's a wire that's unshielded cable, just stranded copper, and that is going to be the ground side. So the opposite connector is going to be the positive connector that you will attach the positive side. We're now going to cut diode D14. This is marked on the circuit board. And I just use a pair of scissors to do this. You really don't need a specialized pair of electronic parts cutters or wire cutters. This will work just fine. Right there, one end is cut. It's hard to see on the video, but it's been done. I'll try and pull it up here for you. There we go. And that would be a good idea just to keep that from possibly shorting back out to the shorted end. Now we have to cut R93, and that's rather difficult to find. You're going to need a magnifying glass to get in and find that resistor. Make sure you get the proper one. But in this case, that's right there. Make sure that you're on the right resistor before you cut that. And again, you can use a pair of scissors to do this.
I know it's hard to see here, but this has been cut, and right there is R93. Again, move the resistor slightly out of the way so it doesn't make contact with any other loose wires. Now, this is a Lodestar audio generator counter. What I'm doing is showing that it's set on 80 cycles, and as you punch each button, it goes up by a factor of approximately 10. So we started at about 80, and now we're up to 78,000, and then we're back down here to 788. Uh, this is a minus dB button. There's two of them. One's minus 20, one's minus 40. You want to keep the minus 20 in. This button controls the output voltage, and then there's a square wave and sine wave function. You want to keep that square wave button pushed in at all times so that we generate square waves. All you do to attach the BNC cable is put it on and give it a half twist and it secures itself. You want to keep this switch all the way up to internal. Otherwise it acts like a counter and it'll count something you might say like any frequencies external to it. You can put an antenna on it even. You want to keep the button pushed in for square waves. This is a digital multimeter and if you notice there's a red and black cable. These are all standard. Put the black cable in the common output and the red cable in the volts ohm amperes output. We attach the red wire from the function generator to the red probe and the black wire to the black probe. I put this on AC volts. Mine reads 200 volts. It'll read to one-tenth of a volt. Some of these will read down into the 200 millivolt region. We want to set this so that the unit produces somewhere right around 100 millivolts. This is a unit that's available at this time, and it produces AC at a 200 millivolt scale. So that means it'll read down from zero millivolts to 100, being very accurate. And the price is right. These are still available, um, and you can call that number there, 1-800-292-7711, and order this if you'd like one like that. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm pressing in and out this minus 20 B dB button to show the effect on the voltage output. And we have this on the AC scale, so it's out, and I get about almost 2.8 volts, and it's in, and it goes down, and I get one-tenth of a volt or 100 millivolts, which is what we want, right on that edge. Now here's a curiosity. Some function generators, as you switch the frequency, the voltage will climb a little bit. A little bit is not bad. 30, 40 millivolts is not a bad thing. But if you see a jump significantly, like 200 millivolts, that's not good. Now I did that deliberately. This unit's very stable. And I'm setting this right on the edge here between 0 and 1. And that's approximately where you want to set it with this particular unit. You can be into the 100, 125 millivolt level without any trouble at all if you have a meter that will read that. Right about there is where you'd want it set. These are the final parts necessary to complete assembly of the unit. These are some solder on eyelets and connectors. Got those at an auto parts store. This is some quarter inch width braided flat wire. These are standard hose clamps. I also purchased at an auto parts store. As you can see, they have a clamping range of about 9 16 to 1 and 1 quarter inch. This is some black number 14 primary wire. Also bought an auto parts store. Some red number 14 primary wire. Bought an auto parts store. This is some 3 16 inch wide flat braided wire. Necessary to make ground connections. You can also use this to wrap the tube with.
Here we have the back side of a Palomar 225. And this is the front side. There's a power switch, a low, medium, and a high switch in the middle, and a preamp switch. The preamp switch is not necessary. It refers only to the receive mode and amplifies the incoming signal. We're not interested in that. First thing we need to do is pull off about five or six feet of the red number 14 wire, and we need to strip both ends of this wire by removing, oh, about a quarter to one half inch of the insulation. Just like that. We now attach this red wire to the red power wire coming out of the Palomar 225. And using the soldering gun, we now heat the joint, apply a little bit of solder, and you're going to have to turn this wire over to get it fully soldered. It's a little bit too thick for the solder to flow completely all the way around the wire. Here we've turned the wire upside down. I'm going to solder to the back side and I've put a pair of there I put a pair of pliers over the wire to hold it down in place as I solder to the back side. Now repeat the same process using the black wire. After you've made the joints, you need to cover them with some sort of insulator. This is called shrink wrap by simply sliding this material over the solder joint and heating it. It shrinks and makes a very tight, secure insulator. You can also just simply use your black electrical tape. It will accomplish the same purpose. Now, using the black electrical tape, we need to bind the two wires, the black and red wire, together so that they just aren't flailing about and get in trouble. So using a small piece of tape, we just about every oh, 08 to 10 inches wrap another piece of tape all the way down the length of the wire to keep the two wires together. Leave about three or four inches at the end so that you can attach a couple of eyelets, which will then go on to the power supply. That basically completes the Palomar 225. It's now all ready for connection. We're now going to make the wires that will drive the tube. And we stake our one quarter inch wide wire and bend the end and twist it slightly so it's a little smaller. So it will fit on the little eyelet. And sometimes it helps to twist this slightly to catch the wire and bring it up through the mounting hole. You can see it's just slightly through the mounting hole there. Now we just add a little bit of solder and that completes one end of the wire. helps to crimp 
and finally straighten the wire after everything's all soldered and finished. You can see both wires are of equal length. You want to make sure that they're equal length so that the power that comes across them will be equally balanced. As you can see, the clamp as it comes out of the package is a little bit too big for the tube here in this case, so we're going to have to turn that down a lot closer. You just take a screwdriver and turn it, and the clamp will just tighten right up for us. how much I had to pull the clamp out. This was only a three-quarter inch outside diameter tube. Most of them that are being made nowadays are one inch outside diameter tube. Now what you do is take your wire and wrap it once around the tube and then slide the hose clamp over the top of it. And then once in place, secure the clamp slightly. Now there's a problem here in that I put the wire to the inside of the tube. It needs to go to the outside of the tube. This is very important. It allows you to wind the tube, and further, it keeps the wires from possibly touching each other and shorting out. And this is a correct method with the wire to the outside of the tube. And as you can see, it's not really firmly attached to the tube. Rather, it's just firm enough so you can slide the clamp easily back and forth. Just a snug fit is all you want. There must be some room underneath the clamp for tube expansion. Otherwise, if the glass gets hot, it will expand and crack. And we have both wires attached to the tube. helps to either cut the little wires on the end of the tube that drive the electrodes off or just simply wind them together and bend them over out of the way. We're now going to add eyelets to the power cord on the CB unit. This is basically the same thing as what we did with the Palomar 225 linear amplifier. It helps to have a good solder gun for this. I would recommend at least 70 watts. 100 would be much better. The radio is now ready for attachment to the power supply. So here we have our modified microphone and our two little eyelets we soldered onto the power cords of the CB radio and our tube. In this case, this tube does not need to be wound. This particular tube will just light with the two clamps in place and our Palomar 225. Now this is the antenna tuner, and we're looking at the back side at the moment. This is an MFJ949E antenna tuner, and this is a little jumper wire you must put between the wire and the balance line. Now I've used just a small piece of the 3 16th of an inch braided cable, but you can also use the number 14 wire that's left over from when you made your power cords. That must be in place. I'm going to make some insulation here for some of the ground strap. 
and you cut this just a little bit shorter than the overall length of your ground cable, this particular cable. Now, as you can see, only one end of this ground cable has an eyelet solder to it. This allows you to thread the cable through the insulating plastic hose. Once through, you're now going to solder the other eyelet on the opposite end. Now, on the side of the CB unit, there are a couple of mounting screws. You need to put a washer underneath between the CB and the mounting screw, and then attach the ground cable to one side of the CB. The other end of the ground cable will then go to the linear amplifier. It helps to put a small washer underneath the mounting screw. And we're going to attach the other ground wire, which goes from the CB unit. To the antenna tuner. This wire is considerably longer and read your manual to find out the proper length to cut this. The Palomar 225 needs a cooling fan. And I use a small piece of 3 16 inch diameter wood doweling to place in the four mounting holes in the corner of the fan. You may have to drill these holes out to allow the wooden dowels to fit. The idea is to space the fan slightly above the top of the heat sink of a linear amplifier. In the top of the heat sink, you can see four mounting holes for the power transistors. This is the area on which you wish to mount the fan. This will be the area of maximum heat generation. You can see this is slightly offset from center. Now I have the completed CB linear amplifier, antenna tuner, fan, our coaxial cables, a short 18-incher, and a long 18-footer, your power supply, a 7 16th inch wrench, and the function generator, along with the power strip that will be necessary to make the device operational. First, thread your short cable from the CB to the linear amplifier. Now, you can use a long 18-foot cable. It does not seem to make too much difference at this point using this short cable, but it does help limit the amount of stray radio frequency in the room by using this short cable, and therefore helps stabilize your function generator. Now, I am loosening the nut for the ground connection from the CB radio to the antenna tuner. We now take the 18-foot long cable and attach it 
from the output on the linear amplifier that says antenna, and this will go to the antenna tuner. This goes into the connector mark transmitter on the antenna tuner. Now attach the plasma tube to the connectors on the back of the antenna tuner. That is basically all that's necessary to make the majority of the pieces operate. It's now time to connect the power cords to the power supply. And as you can see, at the top of the power supply, there's a little positive mark, and we attach all the solid red wires to this positive terminal. and use a wrench to secure this down and then proceed on to connect all the black wires or in some cases there's a red wire with a black stripe. This too would go to the negative terminal. Sure your wires are in the right place before you ever turn anything on. If you have your wires crossed, you will destroy the instrument. Now ready to turn the device on and get it operational. First thing is to turn on the power supply. Next, turn on your CB radio and set to channel 14. Then turn on your function generator and set it to approximately 700 cycles. Finally, turn on your linear amplifier. Now ready to start the unit, but first we must test it. So we turn the antenna selector down to dummy load and then key the microphone to make sure that power is coming into the unit. And your both needles should swing up and you should practice trying to get the SWR level down to the absolute minimum, if at all possible. Once you think you have that knack of getting your SWR set, turn the antenna selector back up to your balanced line wire selector on the tuned side of the instrument and key the mic. With a little luck, your tube will just light right up just like that. Now, as you can see, the function generator output takes a big jump here. It's because it's too close to all the RF. You can see it's sitting maybe within about six inches of one of the leads there to the plasma tube. It just completely overrides the unit. If you get it a couple feet away, everything is quite stable. You turn the knob up and down. You can notice that the tone goes up and down in the unit. Now this is the new way of winding tubes. You can see there's a small aluminum reflector behind and a very simple box. I have all of about four or five dollars in this particular box. You can see there's a clamp on the end and then one more wind out to the end secured with a piece of electrical tape. This technique 
seems to chart most tubes quite effectively. Now I use screws to secure everything together. This is all made out of one half inch by four inch pine board. Two pieces about six feet long. This is a more standard way of winding the tube using the clamps closer together at the center and then winding outward with about two turns to the ends. This is the aluminum used for the reflector. It is 20 thousandths of an inch thick and is freely available at most hardware stores. Here I'm just showing you a measurement of it. The nice thing about this aluminum is it is easily cuttable with just a simple pair of scissors. Aluminum is also very easy to bend just with your bare hands over a straight edge of a table. Now, I didn't really line this up and measure it like I should, so it's going to come out a little crooked. But I think you get the idea. You get a nice square bend when you do that. You secure the aluminum using some upholstery tacks. These are a little sturdier than your normal thumbtack and can be easily hammered into place through the thin aluminum. If the angle is a little too steep on the aluminum plate, you can always just bend it back out straight if necessary. Now this is a completed unit here set up in my cart. Now what's wrong with this card is it has a lot of metal framework and we found that it's better not to have a metal framework. It's better to use an all wooden card, but this lays things out pretty easily so you can see them. A little function generator down below is the Kinnaman unit that is mentioned in the book. It's still undergoing evaluation by me at the moment. Here we see a unit in 510XL CB my original linear amplifier, which is mentioned in the book, power supply, microphone, function generator. Here's a little close-up. The little box coming out of the function generator is a voltage reducer. close-up of the antenna tuner and in its standard operating mode. I'm now going to start the tube, giving you a better idea of what it's like to get a tube started. As you can see, it doesn't always start on the first try, and you have to keep fiddling around a little bit with the antenna match knot. The idea is to minimize the SWR by getting the needle on the left side up as high as possible and the needle on the right down as far as possible. Here we're making about a hundred and oh roughly twenty watts. You can see the plasma wave will distort slightly as you get very high SWRs. Leaving your SWR much above 3 
for more than approximately 15, 20 seconds, risk damage to the unit. Here you can get standing waves within the plasma tube. These little balls are standing waves of energy. Here's some more standing waves. You can see they'll run forwards and they'll run backwards. This is a neon tube. You can see it's quite bright and has a more orangish cast. In this case, changing the SWR merely dims the two. Thank you very much for watching.